we'll get started. Welcome everyone to Tech Canada's Deeper Insights webinar series. As always, it is my pleasure to host these webinars. And I don't know if the math is right, but we might have to throw some confetti. This could be our hundredth webinar. Since the, <laughs> since the beginning of the pandemic, we started it in a vengeance to help support business leaders across Canada, um, navigate some very, very challenging situations, and we continue to do so on a, on a biweekly basis. So thank you to all of you who are joining us today in the middle of your summer. It's a pleasure to have you here. I just want to encourage everyone to uh, remember to be as interactive as possible within this format and type your questions into the question box. Uh, Dwight is going to make a few minutes uh, throughout the presentation to, uh, to address your questions. We want to help you to navigate this as well. So today, it is my pleasure to, in, to welcome Dwight Mihalik to this opportunity. I've known Dwight a couple of years now, and Dwight is one of our top Tech Canada speakers. And it's always a pleasure to have our Canadian tech speakers be a part of this webinar series. He is the chair of the International Council of Management Consulting Institute, Institutes and has a tremendous amount of background in helping uh, business leaders support and understand where they're going with the use of management and in consulting practices. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dwight. Welcome. Thank you very much. And what an honor to be uh, on the centennial edition. <laughs> I remember when you first started these out uh, in early 2020, I did a session uh, with my hat on as president of Effective Managers on resilient organizations and uh, how to deal with the pandemic. So, um, so anyway, well done. I, it's been a huge resource uh, uh, to everyone that's availed themselves of it. Um, but today I'm not talking as president of Effective Managers. I'm addressing you as the chair of ICMCI. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful for anyone. So ICMCI is the International Council of Management Consulting Institutes. We're a global body and uh, we have member institutes. So, for example, in Canada, we have CMC Canada, which is the Institute of Management Consultants, uh, which is in Canada and uh, provides management consulting services to members and also provides certification services to members. So as you see on this map, we have um, 47 countries that are marked in gold. So those are the uh, areas of the world where we have national institutes. And in the white area, we have a global institute. So we offer those uh, virtual services uh, anywhere in the world uh, where a management consultant wants to uh, join an institute, uh, collaborate with their peers, and, uh, and ultimately uh, become certified as a management consultant. Uh, we have some uh, uh, 64,000 individual consultant members, um, and uh, we have over 8,000 uh, certified management consultants. So it, it is a dynamic network. Uh, we're continuing to grow, and we're working really hard, particularly in these changing times, to ensure that we, as the profession of management consulting, can provide the best services possible to client organizations. And that is absolutely our focus in terms of helping clients uh, do better in their communities and help with the social and economic um, advancement of, uh, of communities as well in which uh, clients work. So today's topic is why, when, and how to use consulting uh, to leverage your success. And each one of those parts is important. So we do the why, uh, why use consulting, uh, when should you use consulting, and how should you use consulting. And always underline to leverage your success because uh, those of you that are on the call and I know organizations that uh, are in communities are successful. Uh, they've been able to establish a track record and they're moving forward. Sure, it's been harder in the last 18 months, um, but we're getting through this and, and we will be uh, moving forward and trying to get back that, uh, that growth that was in place. So when do you think about using a consultant? Why would you think about using a consultant and how? So each one of those is a, is, um, a section of this presentation this morning um, with about... Um, 
uh, 15 minutes of content roughly for each one of them that I want to present to you. So if uh, uh, I will stop at each one of these sessions to answer questions that you might have on each of them. So do use the Q&A box that's on the bottom of your screen and uh, log your questions and uh, I'd be happy to answer them. And uh, let, let I agree with Ruth Ann, let's make this as absolutely interactive as possible because I want to answer your questions and help you uh, figure out how to use uh, consulting in the best way possible in your organization. The starting point is um, the global uh, industry of consulting. Uh, it's an, it's, uh, it is a global industry. Uh, as uh, management consultants through ICMCI, uh, we have reciprocity across uh, our profession around the entire world. And it's, it's a growing profession. Uh, the last hard data that we have uh, is that uh, the consulting industry is approaching 300 billion US dollars in terms of services provided. Uh, other uh, measuring groups, I saw uh, IBIS World recently published that uh, we were at six, over 600 million US dollars, but they have a much broader definition of consulting. And that's one of the things that I'm going to be uh, talking uh, to you about as we go through this. So the key point is that that with a spend of that kind in the global industry of management consulting, you can be sure that there is a value proposition. We as management consultants are able to add value to client organizations, otherwise they wouldn't be spending the money on it. ROI is very, very important to private sector companies uh, as they uh, establish their businesses and as they grow and as they scale. So part of the challenge then we have as management consultants is how do we interact in the best way possible to provide the services that you need to add the most value in your community? Because that's what it's all about, right? You take the resources that you have in your community, you engage employees, and then you uh, you 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 process uh, either goods or knowledge in such a way that it adds value, and you're able to sell that into your marketplace. So the purpose of management consulting is to help you increase that value so that you can provide the best value possible uh, in your target market and uh, be, uh, be better than your competitors in terms of uh, features and, uh, and costs. So that's just a setup to let you know why I'm talking about this today. The first topic is, is why use consulting to leverage your success? So this is the why part. The starting point is that business as usual is not an option. Um, if you think back to 2019, there were a lot of things happening in the world that were, were disturbing. Uh, natural disasters were increasing, largely because of climate changes, but for other reasons as well. Uh, there were increasing technological uh, disruptions. Uh, we had a global slowdown. We were starting to approach uh, a recession. People were really worried about whether there would be a recession or not. Uh, there was increasing human disruption because of displacement from natural disasters or, or, uh, or economic issues or, or political issues. Uh, we had trade disruption where uh, some of the powers in the world were starting to use trade as an actual weapon uh, against each other. Uh, and, and this caused uh, what was beginning to become the global economy uh, to start to, to start breaking down. Uh, we have the um, uh, whole balance of power in the world was, was starting to change. And then, then we had COVID-19. <laughs> and that was a real slap in the face for us in terms of a wake-up call about how thoroughly we can be disrupted as a society. So organizations everywhere were disrupted in terms of trying to figure out how they could uh, continue uh, in in the case of this in in, in the face of this crisis, and uh, to be able to position themselves so that they could rebound as quickly as possible uh, coming out of the uh, coming out of the pandemic. So one thing that we learned um, is that disruption is here to stay. So as we were seeing this increasing disruption, there's no question that going forward, we're going to see increasing disruption to organizations in industries, uh, in particular markets, uh, or across entire sectors uh, of, of, uh, of the global economy. And this is because there are, the pace of change has just simply increased so much uh, over the last uh, two years uh, that uh, organizations have learned how quickly they can pivot and how quickly they can uh, implement changes that are necessary. So that impacts everybody else uh, in those sectors. If someone has a major breakthrough in terms of their competitive strategy, all of us need to be prepared to, uh, to deal with that. Uh, 
But at the same time that uh, that industry is uh, is facing disruption, the professions generally are facing disruption. So uh, so management consulting being one of those professions. So the availability of knowledge is really changing the way people think of professions. That ability to, to get information uh, that is almost limitless uh, to help you solve your problems and to help you think through uh, what it is you need to do to, uh, to implement change uh, in different ways. So if you think about the example of the medical doctor, it wasn't that long ago, uh, if we were feeling ill, there's some kind of a symptom that we were suffering with, uh, we'd make an appointment with our doctor, we'd go and see the doctor and the doctor would ask us a bunch of questions, uh, help us figure out uh, what was uh, at the bottom of all of those symptoms, and then uh, make a recommendation to us in terms of uh, what the uh, what the cure for might be for that, what was causing the uh, symptoms. So in other words, what is the root cause? What's the disease uh, that is causing, uh, causing this problem? Um, now, we're much more likely to be more aware of our body and to be using Google or Siri or whoever it might be uh, on our uh, knowledge device uh, to figure out on our own, what are the symptoms? What are the possible causes of these symptoms that I have? And to prescribe a cure for ourselves, or if we get really stumped, uh, then to set up that call with the doctor. So exactly the same kind of thing is starting to happen in all of the pre professions, uh, legal, uh, accounting, uh, and management consulting in terms of organizations using that access to knowledge to self-diagnose and, and figure out what it is that, uh, that they need to do to solve that problem that, uh, that they're facing. So this becomes, uh, this becomes an issue because just as some people might self-treat their symptoms, instead of going to see a medical doctor, they might be uh, misdiagnosing uh, what is that problem that they're facing. Um, we can see the same thing, and I have seen the same thing in organizations about uh, trying to treat the symptoms as opposed to trying to get to that root cause. So I thought I'd give you a couple of examples of those just to give you a sense of, of why I'm, I'm talking about this. And then after these uh, these two examples will be near the end of the uh, of the why. So uh, if you have some questions as we're going along, please do uh, do put them into the uh, question and answer box. So the first one is uh, is collaboration. If you've done an engagement survey or if you've polled your uh, your uh, workforce in other ways, collaboration usually comes up as as an issue. Um, the kinds of things I hear in organizations, people say, oh, everybody's great to work with, but boy, it's hard to get uh, so-and-so to support us in the work that we need to do, or it's hard to get collaboration across the organization, or boy, do we suffer from silos in this organization. So seeing that, uh, if an organization does their, uh, their search to figure out, now well, how do we improve collaboration? The kinds of things that are likely to happen is you'll send some people away on some team building exercises to help them get to know each other. Uh, you might have some cross company um, potluck dinners. You might have a company picnic, all in, in the spirit of how do we help our employees get to know each other better so that they can collaborate better. But the root cause issue is not about people wanting to be able to, to know each other better or to like each other more. The root cause issue in this case almost invariably is a lack of clarity of accountability and authority in different parts of the organization. So the head of the organization having made a decision and delegated work to one part of the organization, that one part of the organization goes, and head, goes ahead and does it. So imagine finances given the accountability to produce a new report. So they go about, they generate all of the material they need to do to, to do this analysis. And the first time the people in operations or production hear about, uh, about them needing to provide information for this report is when finance sends it over to them. So now you've got this situation where some poor employee in finance is trying to get information from somebody in production, but they don't see that as their real work. So they're having to, they end up with, uh, with a really uh, collaborative um, uh, issue. So what does it come out? Is the uh, finance feels that production isn't collaborating when in fact, um, uh, production doesn't see this as part of their work, and, and as a result, uh, things fall down between departments. A communication is another one where, where typically organizations do not do well in terms of communication uh, within their organization. Uh, employees rate communication as, as not being well. From the perspective of the, of the employee, uh, this is 
because they're not getting the information they need in the right time frame uh, for them to make the decisions that they need to be able to make. So if we work at the symptomatic level, what we're doing is uh, maybe creating town halls, doing an internal newsletter, having more, more, uh, more uh, email uh, communications about what's going on. But in fact, what the employee is working for, looking for is to understand from their manager what is it that they need to know in this time frame to do their work. So there's a lack of clarity of accountability and authority in terms of delegating work down the organization in the best way possible. So just, just a couple of examples to, uh, to give you an idea of, of, of how the symptoms appear at this level, but the root cause might be more fundamental than that. So just to stop uh, to see if there are any, uh, any questions uh, that anybody would like to ask. The why, the why is kind of uh, setting things up for you. This is great. I mean, Dwight, you have just nailed the jello to the wall with, with uh, you know, identifying the fact that, you know, often organizations and even small companies can be too close to a problem. And, you know, it's the, it's the classic forest for the trees issue is that you think, oh yeah, you know, we do have a silo issue. When in fact, you know, having somebody come and just take a look and, and see where the, where the issues might be differently or ask some questions is so, so good. And, you know, it leans back to you, you know, the, the amount that small businesses have uh, in terms of financial resources need to be used very, very carefully. And so I think you're going to dive into that right now as to when do you want to use those precious resources for that kind of clarity. Um, we do have one question as I've been uh, reiterating there. Now, Scott is asking, what questions do you ask to help identify root causes versus symptoms. So again, this is the type of thing, you know, we don't want people going off to do the self-diagnosis, but mm -hmm. what, what do you want to be looking for and how do, you, how do you differentiate root cause from symptoms? And when do you know that you have identified the root cause and just not another layer of symptom? It's, it's, it's a combination of the two things. Uh, one part is getting the right information, uh, which is the questions I ask. And then the second part is, is what to do with that information. And that's more experience-based in terms of uh, having worked with organizations and tried various things and helped them uh, to, improve, uh, to, to improve systems. So it's, it's the knowledge I've developed over the years in terms of understanding how systems and people uh, relations work uh, inside of organizations. The questions I ask are actually pretty general, and, and usually if I'm going into a new organization, I would ask to meet with the owner and each of the owner's immediate subordinates and uh, hear from them about their work, uh, hear from them about what they feel they're accountable for. Uh, but then at the end, I ask, you know, what, what is getting in the way of you being as effective as possible in your role? And then just listening carefully to, to those roadblocks that they perceive from their perspective. And when you talk to all of the immediate subordinates, it pretty it paints a pretty good picture of where the roadblocks might be and where the hotspots are in terms of some of the disconnects uh, at that level. And uh, once you can get a handle on that, then you can see how it trickles down to the rest of the organization. Excellent. It sounds like forensic listening, not <laughs> yeah. active listening. Good one. Very yes. good. All right. Well, we'll let you carry on. Thank you. Okay. So, so the when, um, the when is, is, is pretty hard to nail down, um, but, but the, the, the key aspect of it is around growth and scaling. So we're talking about environments, we're talking about communities, so we're talking about things that are in, under change uh, all the time. So, so uh, the, the environment in which an organization operates can be very complex. Um, but there is some commonality uh, throughout organizations in terms of how they work together uh, and how, uh, I'm sorry, how employees inside the organization work together and how the owner ensures that the right work is being done at the right time by their employees. So I've developed this, uh, this maturation curve. Uh, which uh, has on, on the x-axis time, so over time things change, and on the uh, y-axis size, so how big you are as an organization. And there is increasing complexity over time uh, in, in the organization. And the recognition of this can really help owners understand why things are changing and what they would need to do uh, to, uh, to do differently in order to ensure that they can continue their success and even more importantly, uh, to, to leverage their success. So at, at the first step, 
it, it's the owner. The owner has an idea, uh, wants to figure out how to how to do this work, and starts doing that work. So the owner is is literally everything about the business. That's that's really the idea and the creation phase of the company. But once uh, there starts to be a proven concept, and you can see that there is a market for either the the service or the products that are are being developed and and delivered to clients, it's time to hire workers. So now it's no longer just the owner. Uh, doing uh, the necessary work, the owner now needs to engage, uh, orient, and train workers to do the work that the owner used to do. So basically what's happening is the owner is now figuring out how to extend uh, the ability of, of this new organization to create more products or services uh, and to make them more readily available uh, throughout the marketplace. So at this stage, the owner now needs to have this new skill about training and, and developing of processes and procedures to really help people understand how it is that they do the work. At stage three, as the organization continues to grow, there's just too many workers for the, man the, for the owner to be able to manage them all and direct them all. So it becomes time to start hiring managers or sometimes independent professionals to, uh, to do that, to, to help with the work. So the owner now, again, is working at a higher uh, level of complexity and needs not only just to train people, which they do with the managers, and to delegate work as they do to the managers, but also to set the context for the whole organization to ensure that decisions that are made by the manager uh, are, are are interpreted correctly by those workers and the, by the managers, and then passed on on down to the workers. So now you're really working at at um, managing three levels in the organization and figuring out the relationship of those processes between the different teams and uh, looking at work again in, in a very different way. At the next step, uh, if uh, once the managers, uh, there's too many managers to be able, for the owner to be able to manage all of the different teams that are in the organization. And by this time, there's usually some specialty developing. So you might be hiring a bookkeeper or an accountant, a human resources person, other individuals to help you with the specialized expertise that you need to do your work. You now have functions. So now in the organization, you have managers of managers, you have functions in different parts of the organization that are specializing in things like production, specializing in things like marketing and sales, uh, specializing in things like uh, product development, whatever they might be in your organization. Uh, so the, the owner, again, needs to be moving up to that next level of complexity to be thinking far enough out into the future about how we're going to change our organization, but now to be able to, to hire these specialist directors who will be operating independent functions and manage across all of those functions to make sure that while each function is doing the best that it possibly can, all of them are pulling in, in the right direction. The other thing to be really wary of at this point in time is, is not to allow silos to start developing. Uh, when I get to the end around steps five and six, almost every organization ever, I've ever seen has silos because each, organ, each part of the organization is working on the specialized functions uh, that they care about, not so much uh, their colleagues in other parts of the organization. So ensuring that those do not develop becomes really, really important. Um, um, at the next level, level five, uh, we then move up into, uh, into an area where the owner now has to start working in abstract terms because you have uh, vice presidents who are managing functions. So this is the departmental structure where you have several different departments uh, that are managing within their own areas. Each one of those vice presidents is kind of a general manager within their own department, uh, working across, keeping all of their functions working well. And the owner now needs to pull that entire system together to make sure the whole organization is, uh, is, is moving in, in, in the right direction. And then uh, you can move up to uh, level six and beyond, uh, seven and eight. Uh, the, um, the, the, the research that's been taking place over the last 70 years shows that there are up to eight levels uh, in organizations. And each one of these levels can be discreetly identified and described. And the way in which that work takes place uh, needs to be understood. So as each organization grows, uh, it becomes important to understand the very differing job that the manager has uh, to be able to deal with um, the, uh, the additional complexity within each one of the organizations. 
And that complexity does bring it with it things, symptoms such as the ones I've mentioned. Uh, communication becomes more difficult um, from the perspective of the owner. The larger you get, the more you have to start to implement systems so that you can ensure that the decisions you made are being interpreted and delegated correctly down the organization. But you also need systems uh, to ensure from the front end um, what's happening so that you can get feedback from the all the employees in the organization in terms of what's going well and, and what might be going off the rails. So in the early stages, steps one, two, and three, the manager, the owner pretty much knows everybody in the organization is able to intervene with everyone and the force of their personality, charisma, passion for, for, for the product or the service is such that it carries the organization. As the organization grows, the owner just simply isn't physically or mentally capable uh, to be able to uh, to touch every person in that way and follow up with everyone. So they start to depend more on services. So I've got one more slide in this section. So uh, so if you have any questions about this stuff, please, please put it in. I'd, I could, I could give you a whole hour just on this one slide, but let's move on. So owners are very good at, at, at the products and services. The owner built this company around the products and services. They know it inside out. They know more than anyone else does uh, about, uh, about what it is that that company does. And they're very good at marketing and sales because by definition, uh, in order to be uh, continuing to exist as a company, not only must you produce your products and services, you have to be able to sell and deliver the products and services. So this is the these are the core businesses of the organization. This is the the, the stuff of, on which uh, success is built. But in my experience, what organizations are not so well at is they're not so good at management systems. And why why should you be in the first three stages of building that organization? Uh, they weren't necessary because you could interact with everybody. You could set the context. You could delegate. You could give feedback. You could train. Uh, you could um, um, change employees. You know you can hire new employees or get rid of employees that aren't working very well. But as you grow as an organization, you need to start relying more and more on systems. So, so just to come back to the symptomatic, I, I guess I, I gave you a little fib. I did have a couple of changes left. One is the, what I call it, the whack-a-mole type of, of uh, solving problems. Because if you're dealing at that, uh, that symptomatic level, uh, it can be very frustrating for you because you try to solve the problem in this part of the organization. You think you've got it solved. Then you move over to the next part of the organization and doesn't it appear there and then it appears somewhere else. So, so it, it really becomes important to get to that root cause uh, aspect of that. And now this really is the last slide in, uh, in this section. I've got three, three triggers for you to think about when you can benefit from this objective expertise of a professional uh, management consultant. Uh, the first one is if you have a major shift in your business focus. So for whatever reason, COVID was a really good example of that. For whatever reason, you have to really make a major shift. So being able to rely on that objective advice from someone who's done it a number of times in different organizations and can draw on that experience, uh, from someone who's a specialist in, in solving those kinds of problems and understands the relationships between the symptoms and the root causes, uh, that, that, that would be a good time to uh, bring someone in. It could be if there's a major change in, in size of your organization. And this can be what I'm talking about, the maturation curve, you're moving up to, to the next level. It's, it's, it's a good opportunity for you to, to get some insider advice on, uh, on what you may have to be doing differently if you're starting to add an extra level of management in your organization. And if you, if you acquire another organization, if there's an acquisition, the integration of that and getting your ROI in, in the best way possible uh, is important. So, uh, so, uh, so think about, uh, about, um, about uh, professional advice then. And, and it's the whack-a-mole thing, the recurring problem. You've been trying to solve something and you haven't had any success in it. Uh, really do think about, uh, about engaging uh, support at that point. So that does bring me uh, to the end of the when, and we can now uh, now maybe have a bit of discussion before we move on to the how. That was great. And I know, you know, the maturation curve is, you know, pretty straightforward, but just seeing it illuminated like that, you can see how complexity builds in greater layers of problems. So thank you for, for bringing that out. Steven from Houston has a question. And he says, does management typically know the root cause, but are reluctant to address it? So it's bringing up sacred cows. 
How do you address the sacred cow? Um, that's really good, uh, Stephen. It, in, in working with organizations, that is sometimes the issue. So, uh, so the, the owner or the executive team um, have, a, have a good suspicion of, of what the issue might be. I remember working with, with one client uh, where there were, uh, there were major, major issues in, in their operational end, their North American uh, company uh, had 80% of the market share. So they're doing very well. Uh, but when they lost their operations director, they brought in a new one. Uh, and the new one that came in was really, really good at operations, but could not manage his way out of a, out of a wet paper bag. So what was starting to happen uh, very quickly in, in the different um, production units around uh, North America is morale was starting to go down. Uh, issues were starting to rise, uh, arise with, with employees not feeling they were getting the right direction. Um, but through, through force of personality and coercion, uh, this person was able to ensure that profits continued, production continued to increase and so on, but at the cost of the people. So it was quite clear from the perspective of the owner that something needed to be done, but at what cost and what would be the reaction of the shareholders. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that kind of an issue where, where at the end of the day, uh, the owner or the CEO in this case just really needs to to know what is the best thing. This is where in in terms of the work that you do on your strategic plans, those value statements really, really do come uh, become helpful because are you uh, doing your work uh, in a consistent way with uh, with your uh, with the values of, of your organization? And if you're not, um, you better uh, make make the change, even though it, uh, it might be a very hard change. Um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ruthann, and then I'll, I'll, I'll continue on. I was just going to ask, um, I know that, you know, you can put your management hat on here at this point, but, you know, at what level or, you know, at what point should an organization start to look at training and uh, developing their managers, even though they put managers in place, how do they work towards, you know, creating that, that, that chain of authority and communication with their managers, when and how? Yeah. Um, it's, um, as you know, from the name of my company, Effective Managers, <laughs> this, is, this is something that, that is critically important. Um, in the research that we did with the University of Ottawa, we, managers report that they only spend 55% of their time doing value-added work. So, so managers are being distracted continually because of some of these other issues that are happening in the organization. If the accountability and authority framework isn't straight, isn't clear from the top down, then they're having to figure it out on themselves. For themselves, so they're going to meetings, creating meetings, or whatever, doing stuff to try to figure that out. Um, and uh, if if the cross-functional accountability and authority isn't clear, they're in co in conflict situations. So they're trying to negotiate how do we collaborate with each other instead of just getting down getting down to do the work. So so there's two parts to that. One part is from the owner's perspective. What, what is the language that we use in our organization uh, to describe how we manage here and how we collaborate here? And how do we ensure that everyone in the organization uh, is, is, is following those principles in terms of the rules of the road uh, inside of this organization? The second one is how do we get the right people in the right roles so that they do know how to focus in on, on the right work? And that includes for manager roles, uh, manager leadership capability. So it was a long start to your answer to come back to the training is that in most organizations, uh, there isn't training for for managers, frontline managers. Yes, it's pretty, it's pretty good. You know, your first time you're a manager, they send you along to frontline manager training. But when you become a director or a vice president there, you know, what is the difference? What is the increased complexity? How do you have to manage differently? How do you add value uh, to your teams? These these things are, are, are not taught and, and should be and can be. Uh, so it becomes really, really important important for owners to think about that as well. Fantastic and, and a great answer and, and probably another uh, session on just that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let you continue because the questions are coming in on how. So let's go. Okay. Forward. Okay. Very good. So I'll let you manage those. Thank you for doing that. So the how to use consulting uh, to, to leverage your success. So here's the, here's the, uh, the starting point for the how, and it's the question, what is a consultant? 
And the answer in Canada, and in fact, in, in every country of the world except one, uh, the answer is a consultant is anyone who goes down to their, uh, their, their corner printing store and prints a business card that says they're a consultant. So if you have consultant on your business card, there's nothing legally stopping you from saying that you are a consultant. So consulting is not a regulated industry, except in the country of Austria. Where, where everything from baker to candlestick maker uh, and consulting is, is regulated. So in that country, if you want to say you're a consultant, you need to register with the Institute and you need to, uh, to take certain training in order to be, prove your competence in doing that. So, but in Canada, where, where, where we're, uh, we're, we're doing this uh, webinar today, uh, there is a very low barrier to entry. That has been... Um, increased or, 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 or the differentiation has been lessened actually in, in, in the last few years from what I call the Uberization of consulting. So it's easier and easier for people who would say they're consultants uh, to get their name out there and, and to, to promote themselves as, as consultants providing specialized expertise. And if you remember back to the slide I had earlier about uh, the availability of knowledge, it's becoming increasingly easy for organizations who feel that they have a need that they want to solve to go out into the marketplace to find someone who has that specialized expertise that they need to provide them and support them in, in the work that, uh, that they need to do. So I just, I just, pulled out a few examples for you. Um, and this might be, if you do need specialized expertise, this, this is a way to get it. I, the only point I'm making is there's a difference between specialized expertise and, and uh, consulting. So for example, this one from Hourly Nerd, uh, your project, your price, uh, you can receive bids from over 25,000 of the world's smartest business experts. So this is a, this is a portal uh, where if you want to find someone that can support you in a particular type of work, uh, you can be matched up with them. Uh, Tall Mix. Um, in this case, uh, we have over 25,000 consultants uh, who are available to, uh, to help you do the work that you need to get done in your organization. This is over 25,000 people in over 150 countries. So that's the other thing about professions, the borders that uh, were so, um, so differentiating uh, in the past are starting to break down as well, because now an organization can go any, anywhere in the world to get the expertise they want. Expert 360. Uh, here you can uh, allow businesses and individuals to come together to great to do great project work. Uh, your Harvey, I like this one because it's a UK company, and a Harvey is uh, is like a, a personal assistant. Uh, it's a, a nickname for a personal assistant. So uh, so in this case, you can um, you can uh, uh, become a Harvey just by clicking on that button. So this is the barrier uh, to becoming a, a consultant or, or a Harvey in this organization. And what, the one of the ones that's uh, emerging as the largest, and you may have heard them co-match, uh, everyone can call themselves consultants. We recognize the good one. So you can click here to find a consultant, uh, but here you can click to, uh, to become a consultant. So I, I don't want to beat this particular horse to, to death, uh, but, it, but the point I'm making here uh, and reinforcing to you is that when you want specialized expertise, the world is really opening up in terms of, of borders breaking down and the availability of being able to reach out to others to get that work done for you. So, uh, so, so if you have a specialized expertise need, uh, not too long ago, your only option was to go out into the community and, and hire for it. Now you can go on to one of these portals. There's over 300 now. It's increased from 63 years ago to 300 uh, uh, last month uh, when I, I read an article. Um, you, you, can, you can identify that expertise to help you out. But the key thing is, is really think carefully about are you addressing the symptom or are you addressing the root cause of what the issue is? So one more example for you. Um, think about uh, an organization that has a problem with project management. So projects tend to run late. They tend to run over budget. Uh, they tend to, uh, to uh, involve more people than, than would be expected. And they tend not to deliver the results that, uh, that were expected at the beginning of the project. 
So a decision is made by the executive team, we're going to improve our project management because project management is a real problem in our organization. So you go on to Comatch or any one of these other places and you find a world-class expert in project management and you hire that person for three months to come into the company and, and help you fix your project management system. So that person will come in and they will help you develop and, and put in place one of the you know, uh, best practices uh, project management system. They'll have the, you know, how, you, how you record your projects, how you ensure that projects are properly documented, how you set up charters, how you set up the project teams, how you do the Gantt charts. So all of that can be in place in your organization. But after the three months and they go away, what are the odds that you're going to continue to have problems in project management? It may have solved the problem, uh, but the, the underlying, there might have been a root cause issue, which is around accountability and authority. Perhaps in your organization, when a project team is formed, it's not clear what is the accountability of your directors and managers in your organization about what they need to do to change so that you can implement this change effectively uh, versus what the project team needs to do. In most organizations, they see the project team as the people that are implementing the project. And uh, you know, we can go about doing our day-to-day -day work and the project team will make this, this happen. In fact, for success in implementing your project, the owner needs to make it really, really clear that each one of the team members, each one of their subordinates has work to do in terms of implementing this change. And then they have work to do in terms of ensuring that each one of their subordinates works differently uh, so that they can implement the chain change. And, and the project team has cross-functional accountability for, for, um, for coordinating, for training, uh, for, um, for perhaps trying to persuade people to, to stay on schedule, whatever it might be, but they don't have managerial accountability and authority because they're not the managers of the people that have to work differently at, at the end of the day. So, so, so the advice to you is, is when you are uh, trying to tackle some of these issues that are really getting in the way of what you feel are your success is your success is how do you uh, ensure that uh, that you're focusing in on the right kinds of issues so that you're making change changes that will uh, that will resolve the, that problem. So I have a couple uh, a couple of uh, suggestions for you here and, and to give you some additional information. Um, uh, the um, and if there's any questions about this, uh, please do jump in with them because I think this is a really this is kind of the critical point of uh, of the presentation that I have for you uh, this morning. So if you if so, how do you find uh, this professional uh, management consultant? Um, certainly, you can go to one of the big four, or uh, you know, you can go to Deloitte or Ernst or KPMG, and and they will have uh, professional management consultants that that have been well trained and well versed in the profession. Uh, that will that will come with some baggage in terms of the processes that those big firms apply in terms of solving those kinds of problems. Although uh, they are also recognizing the change in orientation of uh, client organizations and trying to to go more boutique with with many of their branch operations or to one of the next tiers the mckenzie's or the uh, or, or the baines or or whatever it might be or uh, you can uh, you can uh, try to find that specialized expertise that's available out there but that has a proven track record and uh, does understand the profession of management consulting and, and what is the ROI that they need to bring to you uh, in order to be able to uh, ensure that you are solving the root cause problem. And when you're putting your resources uh, to, uh, to use uh, in your organization, you're focusing them in on the right way. So here's, here's two things that I wanted to, wanted to share with you uh, in, in, in the few minutes that we have left. Um, there are two marks of excellence that, that you should watch for. The first one is the CMC. It's the Certified Management Consultant. I wear my Canada pin and I wear my CMC pin. Those are the only two I wear. And, and it, it, is, uh, it does show that the person that wears that pin uh, has... Uh, uh, has demonstrated competence uh, as a professional management consultant. And I'll tell you uh, what, what that means exactly in, in a few minutes. Uh, and the second is, is uh, a relatively new standard in, in, in standard terms. It's uh, ISO 20700. It's the first uh, services standard uh, that ISO has ever put out. Uh, we at ICMCI were instrumental in working with ISO. Uh, we 
put members on the uh, on the working group. In fact, one of our current directors of our board uh, was the chair of the working group for uh, for this uh, developing this ISO 27,000 standard. And Canadian uh, consultants were very heavily involved in in the development of this standard as well. And it really is about what are, what is the baseline for the for the uh, creation, the implementation, and the closing of a professional management consulting services program. So, uh, so we've now developed at ICMCI a checklist uh, where we do train uh, uh, consultants in how to use the checklist to work with clients to ensure that there's complete transparency between what the client uh, wants and what the uh, uh, consultant believes they can deliver so that there's no nasty surprises at any point uh, along the project. And I'll give you a couple of insights into exactly what that means. So first, the certified uh, management consultant, uh, professionals trusted for, uh, for critical times. Uh, the first uh, in terms of how we do this is that at ICMCI, we have developed uh, and have had in place for, uh, um, let's see, uh, going on three decades now, a competency framework. And that competency framework lays out uh, where uh, a certified management consultant must be able to de demonstrate competency. The first one is, is around uh, client business insights. So how do we help clients to be better? And then the second is around, uh, around consulting business insights. So how, how does one consult? So a lot of that is done through, through training in terms of, uh, of helping um, the uh, consultant who wants to become certified to, to understand that. They have to take tests to demonstrate their capability. But but also uh, that they have uh, shown uh, through experience uh, that they have been able to work with uh, with clients. The second is around the technical competencies. So, so what are the functional specializations? Most consultants have a have a focus. Mine is on uh, on uh, organizational performance, and uh, I work with uh, with clients specifically to help them uh, leverage uh, leverage their success as they as they grow and 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 as they scale. So that's my specialty. If you wanted someone for human resources programs, you would go to another management consultant that would have that functional specialty. But the consulting skills skills have to be consistent and, and we're taught uh, what that means and, and how one does that. And then the third is the values and, and the behavior competence. So we, we really do ensure that all of our management consultants are working according to a code of ethics and that they have the, the analytical and the personal development skills that are, that are necessary. And then they, on the column on the right, they have to have this continued professional development, just as a doctor or a lawyer needs to do a lot of reading and to keep up with best practices, uh, so, do, uh, so do management consultants. So we have a very rigorous uh, certification process. Uh, we have a common body of knowledge, knowledge that the consultant must be familiar with. They need to demonstrate experience, so uh, at least three years of experience as a full-time management consultant in terms of proving the number of hours uh, per year that you're putting into uh, to doing that work and demonstrated success. So, uh, so the consultant needs to identify and work with client organizations uh, to put together uh, a case study of, of the work that they did and, uh, and the client to sign off that the, the project was successful and it met the goals that were intended. And it's approval by peers. And I think this is the strongest part of it. And it's any profession. Any, any profession has an academy or, or, uh, or an institute. Uh, so when, when one joins the institute in Canada, for example, they're, they're uh, accepted by their peers. When one is certified, they uh, attend an oral review, an oral panel, uh, where their peers ask them questions about all of the documentation that was submitted to ensure that the person actually has the competence uh, and the experience that they've, uh, they've talked about. The ongoing professional development I mentioned already, and then the, uh, the code of professional conduct. Uh, so anyone that signed, that, that, uh, that uh, um, uh, applies to be a member of the Institute, whether they're certified or not, must sign this uh, professional code of, uh, of conduct. So it's all about serving the interests of the client. So the code of conduct means that we, uh, we, uh, we, we sign and, and uh, we agree that in all cases, it's the interests of the client come before our own interests. So once we take on a project, it's delivering that project according to the client's needs. Transparency of representation. So if I have a product or a service which I'm, which I'm presenting to a client to, to, uh, to help them solve a need, if I have an interest in, in that uh, product or that service, uh, it has to be declared. So, so we're not, uh, we, we, so that there's complete transparency at all times 
aligns with the client and professional behavior, whether we're on a consulting project or not, we have to behave in ways that are consistent uh, with the profession. So from the perspective of the client, uh, you can expect more valuable advice because this is all about uh, how how we can help you to do better work and how we can help you to have more value in, in your organization. And, and uh, that comes from uh, experience and it comes from knowledge. And uh, by having proven that competency, uh, you can be assured that uh, we're bringing both to the table. Integrity becomes very, very important in terms of how we do our work and, and how we ensure that you're receiving the services that you need. Uh, transparency, I talked about already, and ISO is all about transparency, uh, but transparency in terms of what are the services that you need, what are the services that I deliver, and how can we ensure that there's a complete match and we both have the same understanding. Accountability, uh, consultants are accountable to the client. Uh, one of the things that we always ensure is that we're, uh, the client is clearly identified and we have that single point of accountability in the client organization so that we know uh, who our client is and how we're working with them and how we can uh, support them in doing their work. You get access to a global network. I mentioned earlier that there is reciprocity across CMCs. Uh, my business model as a management consultant is, is to work with colleagues in other parts of the world so I can have a global practice without employees because uh, by finding CMCs in other countries uh, where there are needs of the kinds of services I provide, I can train those consultants, support those consultants, and, uh, and support uh, clients in other parts of the world with full knowledge that... Um, that, uh, that uh, those consultants I'm working with have the skills and knowledge they need because they are uh, a CMC. Uh, in the same way that when you're looking for expertise, if it becomes a more complex project, uh, they can reach out and find someone that has that specialized professional expertise that you might need, all, all to give you uh, confidence and, and some assurances of, uh, of best value. Um, Ruthann, I think I might stop there. I have a few words about uh, about ISO 20,700, but if there are any questions about the about the how and the CMC, maybe we should deal do with those, and then I can uh, I can close on ISO. No, I think the question uh, and again came from Stephen is about you know if a man management consultant is going to and you know try to to gain the confidence uh, of a client and convince them on the ROI of why they should go with them. I think you've laid down the groundwork for that right now, you know, with the CMC certification, which is, I have to say, I really love the aspect that you've, that you've built in the accountability of peer-to-peer uh, -peer professional review on that. I think that's, that's another aspect. So yeah, exactly. uh, we'll let you, we'll let you finish off. And then I've got a couple of tag notes. Okay, perfect. So ISO uh, 20,700. So this is all about transparency and, 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 and it's about around the scope, the terms, the definitions, the principles of management consulting programs. Now it's, 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 uh, it's not best practices in the world because every, every uh, professional can add to this standard, but it's establishing that baseline of what it is that a client should expect from a management consultant. And it does it in three areas. The first one is around contracting. So if if, um, if, uh, if we're going to put in place a contract um, to help you uh, with a project that you need to have implemented, what are the different kinds of conversations that we need to have uh, to ensure that we're both in exactly the same place when we start that project? Uh, it's, it's disastrous if, if a client goes, if a consultant goes into a client's organization and uh, a month or two months down the road, uh, feels that they're making great progress, gives the interim report to the cl client and the client says, wait a minute, I wasn't expecting this or I wanted that as well. It, it, it's very, very difficult to recover from that. So it's better to have those conversations up front. So we've developed the ISO 20700 checklist, which, which asks those questions. So the consultant goes through it all based on the uh, uh, RFP or um, upfront meetings. The, client, the consultant goes through and, and notes things that are covered off and those things that might have questions, and then sits down with the client and, and walks through uh, that checklist just to make sure that, uh, that there's nothing uh, needs to be discussed that hasn't been discussed. Uh, then there's a section for the execution. How do we go about uh, implementing uh, this project? What, what is the role of the consultant? What is the role of the client? Uh, what are the roles inside the client organization that need to be involved? Who are the stakeholders and, and so on? 
And then finally, closure. What does it mean uh, that this project is, is closed? How do we understand whether this project is, uh, is completed or not? And then finally, 12 policies, which we find that are really, really important uh, for, uh, for um, um, client work. You know, are there any regulatory issues? Uh, do we have any issues with stakeholders that we need to be aware of or to people we shouldn't be talking to, for example? Uh, and, and so on, the 12, uh, 12 policies are, are all laid out there. So at the end of the day, then, uh, in, this, uh, in this checklist, once it's completed, you have full transparency. Uh, we've uh, recently started providing this training to our consultants in, in Canada. It's a relatively new program, uh, and it, it uh, is uh, issued around the world. We have our website, ISO 20700, ISO20700.org. And every consultant in the world that has been trained on uh, on this uh, standard uh, is is listed there. So we're rolling it out in Canada. It's got great uh, uptick, and uh, you'll be seeing more and more of this. And we're also in the process of developing uh, a small module, probably about two hours for client organizations, uh, to give you access to that checklist, so that when you're engaging uh, consulting support, uh, it gives you a tool that you can use uh, for for procurement purposes. So uh, that's bringing me to uh, to the close. I wanted to bring you up to date on that. Uh, here's the uh, uh, the uh, screenshot I took last night of the CMC Canada website. It's cmc-canada.ca. And if you see in the top right corner there, find a consultant. So you can just click on that. And uh, there are different fields you can fill in if you're looking for a, a particular type of consultant. Or uh, if, you're, um, if you're thinking about at some point, you might want to be a, a consultant. Many people in mid-career or after having sold a successful business want to go into consulting, do check it out because uh, uh, going along the certification path uh, takes some effort, but you would never be sorry. I know there's many international uh, colleagues here too. So, uh, so this is the CMC Global, the ICMCI website. Uh, many people find ICMCI uh, a mouthful, which it is. <laughs> so our, 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 our public branding is cmc-global.org. Uh, so you can go onto our website there. And uh, if you see on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, uh, you can click there and that will bring up um, a listing of all of the um, uh, uh, countries where we do have institutes. And if you're for, from a country that's not listed there, then CMCGI, that's the CMC Global Institute is, uh, is the one to check out. And do, do feel free to be in touch with me, please. Uh, I put both my email addresses here, the consulting one, uh, for my volunteer work, Dwight Mahalitz at cmc-global.org, or, or my personal uh, uh, one is at Dwight at effectivemanagers.com, and feel free to uh, reach out to me from LinkedIn and Facebook. And as, as most speakers uh, at these kinds of sessions, I do offer complimentary introductory sessions, kind of like kind of like the lawyer, the first call is always free. So if there's anything that I, I talked about today that uh, strikes your interest or that you'd like to know more about, or, or that uh, you'd like to kind of figure out how it might or might not apply in your situation, uh, feel free to be in touch with me. I'd love to chat with you about that. And um, if it works out that we can work together, that's, that's amazing. And if it doesn't, then that's also amazing because I just love talking with people about, about these things. So, so thank you very much. It brings us uh, up to a couple of minutes to the hour. And I know you have a couple of things you have to uh, put in there, Ruth Ann. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Dwight. And I want to thank you for putting some rigor around a billion dollar business in terms of the consultancy and that you know it is great to see that and it it i truly believe that it's going to give value and uh credibility to those individuals who want to step onto that platform and feel very proud that you know they're not just hanging a shingle that they've gone through that so thank you for the work that you've done on that it's amazing yeah. Um, I want to put a shameless plug in. Uh, you talked about training managers, and Dwight is part of our emerging leaders program that we have here at Tech, and it is designed for you know greenhousing your your developing managers, your your leaders, or your soon to be leaders in your organizations to help prepare them for that that next step of growth in your company and and their role and what they should be looking for. And last but not least is that you talked about project management and it's like I planned it. Our next webinar is, is <laughs> Gabrielle mausner Schutten, who is probably one of the best project managers uh, in Canada right now. And she's gonna be talking about, uh, you know, going through and what pitfalls and some of the myths around that. So 
Thank you again, Dwight, for joining us today. And thanks to everybody on the line. Please do connect with Dwight on LinkedIn. If you are a tech member, remember that you can engage with, with Dwight uh, and book him to come into your tech meeting to go into some deeper dive. In, in he's got several topics that he can, can really sort of um, open up for you and help give some clarity. So thanks again, Dwight. Thanks, thanks to everybody. Enjoy your, enjoy your summer day.